as a first introduction to the distinction between theory and observation and the role that observation plays in theory testing, I think this is perfectly fine. It captures something obviously right about what a scientific theory is and how theories are tested. However, as a full account of the relationship between theory and observation in science, uh, this picture is not adequate and potentially quite misleading. Here's one objection. There are others, but this is the one I'm going to focus on here. This picture unpacks the concept of an empirical phenomena in terms of observations, and it unpacks the concept of an observation in terms of the perceptual experiences of human beings. Now, some phenomena in science are like this, but unfortunately for this picture, many phenomena in science are not. The fact is that a lot of scientific data gathering isn't really perceptual at all. It doesn't involve directly perceiving the phenomena that the data is giving us information about. Look at this example. These are tracks in an instrument called a bubble chamber. It's used to detect the paths of subatomic particles. The chamber is filled with a superheated fluid. Uh, the lines that you see are actually trails of tiny bubbles that are created when a particle moves through the fluid. You can learn a lot about the properties of the particles by the paths they make. But it's a stretch to say that you're observing the particles, certainly not directly. Uh, in fact, what the scientist observes aren't even the bubble trails. What is being directly observed are lines on photographic film. Yet the way this instrument is used, we routinely interpret these lines as empirical data indicating the presence of subatomic particles of various types. So we're capturing an empirical phenomenon, for sure, but it's only loosely connected to perception. Here's another example. This is a scientist examining brain scans of a patient using fMRI technology. fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Image. The colors on the computer screen indicate different levels of electrical activity in different regions of the brain as a patient performs some cognitive task. We use this kind of data all the time to test theories about how brains function. But here's the question. What exactly is the scientist observing? How are these images actually created? Well, it's an extremely complex and indirect process, but here's a sketch. You send brief magnetic pulses into the brain. These pulses cause protons and hemoglobin to emit radio signals. When the magnetic field is relaxed, the radio signals decay, but the rate of decay depends on if the hemoglobin has more oxygen in it or less oxygen in it. Then a computer takes these signals and uses elaborate algorithms to estimate the blood oxygen levels at the regions where the radio signals originated. And then more algorithms are used to correlate oxygen levels with levels of electrical activity and the location of firing neurons. And then all of this information is used to assign the appropriate color to a pixel in a computer-generated image of the brain. So in this process, the sensory experience of the scientist is limited to monitoring the equipment, keeping an eye on the patient, and discriminating the colors in an image. So if we want to say that fMRI images record observations, it's very hard to say what exactly was observed. This is very far from our paradigm examples of direct observation. But we use this kind of data all the time in science to test theories. So we really do need to rethink this traditional way of distinguishing theory from observation. My view, and I think it's the majority view among philosophers of science, is that all observation is theory dependent in some way, and all data gathering activities are theory driven in some way. As we've seen, there are theoretical assumptions that underlie the operation of the devices that we use to collect and interpret data, and the interpretation of the data itself. That's the top row in this diagram here. Then from this data, we often construct models of the observable phenomena. That's the down arrow here on the left. In our fMRI example, that's the path that leads from radio signals emitted from hemoglobin molecules to computer images of brain activity. Every stage of this process is informed and guided by different kinds of theories. Interpreting fMRI images as data about brain activity is itself a highly theoretical exercise. But once we've judged the fMRI to be a reliable instrument, 
then we can treat those images as empirical phenomena that can then be used to test our actual theories of brain function, which was the whole point of the exercise. And that's the bottom row in this diagram. So ultimately, my view is that the concept of theory in science is defined by the various roles that the activity of theorizing plays in asking and answering questions about nature. Once you understand these roles, then you understand what theories are and how they're used. Now, one of these roles is as described at the top of this video. We posit theories to help us explain and understand phenomena that we don't fully understand yet. That is still true. It's just not the only role that theories play in science. The practice of science is a theory-laden exercise from top to bottom. Scientists rely on theories at all stages of the process of scientific inquiry, including the construction and interpretation of empirical phenomena. This admittedly complicates the story that we tell about the role of theory in science, but it's a more accurate story and, I think, a more interesting story.